Talk Radio. Get ready, America, for Deadline Live with your host, Jack Blood. Deadline Live is the daily wrap-up for those too busy in the daily grind to discern and dissect the news. While the so-called mainstream media buries the truth, Jack Blood uncovers it, exposing the lies that our trusted government officials do not want us to know. And now, please welcome Jack Blood. We are locked and loaded for the propaganda war. Second hour of Deadline Live coming your way. Thanks for joining us. It is January 13th, 2011. I'm Jack Blood, your narrator, your radio gone, reporting for the next hour. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. That is 4 to 6 on the East Coast. If you missed the show, and uh, many of you do, uh, you're working in the middle of the day. I understand that. <laughs> A lot of people listening at work. Get back to work. No, uh, you're working now on uh, educating yourself. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, but our, our archives, our uh, podcast, everything is free. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to pay 62 cents a day. No, none of this. Just go get it all for free and send it out to everybody that you can. We have got some amazing guests uh, coming up, uh, not just today. As Susan Lindauer joins us, the 9-11 whistleblower. But uh, every day, uh, <laughs> I got a new book out on uh, JFK. We talk about that tomorrow. Great guests all next week. Uh, so please, you know, get the word out for us. I, I know you want to keep this all to yourself, and maybe some of you are a little embarrassed to tell people about this show, because I'm probably going to do something to uh, uh, make you look bad. I'm sorry. I warn people at first. The guy's a little crazy, but uh, he has some good guests. I don't know. Say whatever you want. He plays good music. I don't know about the rest of the stuff he says. Uh, and we're trying to communicate, again, to uh, an audience that is probably more at risk than anyone else in the world. That is, you know, our young men and women. So we try to gear the show to them and make it uh, sexy and entertaining if we can. Yeah, Not, not going to hear a lot of truther shows say that because we're not one. Uh, this is just in. This is going to go with the story we're going to tell you here for the entire second hour, allegedly. <laughs> An acclaimed author said the DHS, that is the Department of Homeland Security, recruited him to write terror plots. Yes, and guess who that is? That is Brad Metzler, host of the History Channel's Conspiracy Show. Right. Yes, yeah, so we have a video on the site uh, presenting footage of Brad Metzler speaking in New York City about his role as a consultant for the Department of Homeland Security designing terror plots. Uh, we've got a clip here of Danny Panzella from the True Squad TV uh, covering this story. He also connects the dots to Michael Chertoff and the underwear bomb plot. Is Brad Metzler going to do a conspiracy show on himself with that? Uh, I'd like to see that. Can one of you guys that are going to be invited to go on that show, can you ask him about that? Just take him aside. Just tell him it's off the record between the two of you. Obviously, I'm not going to be ever <laughs> invited to that show. We have a film crew coming here Saturday. We get filmed for stuff all the time, but, but never for this kind of mainstream uh, stuff. Not anymore. Because I'm likely to, to make a lot of sense and not to embarrass myself. Believe it or not, <laughs> it can happen. It can happen. Stay with us. Uh, we'll blow the lid off of 9-11 and the uh, war in Iraq and Afghanistan right after this. Susan Lindauer is coming up and joining us for her book, Extreme Prejudice. Stay with us. Deadline Live Oracle. elements of a false flag terror event and an inside job, uh, you might want to tune in to the second hour of our show today. Joining us on the air is Susan Lindauer. Uh, Susan has a new book out called Extreme Prejudice. She was a former CIA asset, uh, an attache to the embassy in Iraq. 
<laughs> her, she's also cousins with Andy Card, who whispered in Bush's ear at Booker Elementary School, and he's reading the Upside Down Goat story. Uh, she's got an amazing insight into this, amazing information that needs to be spread far and wide. We're going to talk about that here in the second hour. Susan, great to have you with us, and I hear you're a big fan of Oracle as well. I'm a huge fan of Oracle. Listen, as a, my story is extraordinary. I was arrested on the Patriot Act when I went uh, 30 days after I went to talk to the offices of Senator Trent Lott and John McCain asking to testify in front of Congress and tell the story about Iraq and 9-11 to the people and, the, and, and bring the story out to the public. And... I was arrested for, and I was held under indictment for five years, and Oracle Broadcasting people helped end my indictment. Oracle Broadcasting, they locked me, the, the feds locked me up in prison on a Texas military base, and then my, my then boyfriend, Jay Fields, came on Oracle Broadcasting and did some radio interviews and raised pressure to get me released. And then after my release, I came on Oracle Broadcasting on Michael Herzog's show at that point and, uh, and, and it, it, it had to fight the feds to stop from getting sent back to prison. And it was, it was amazing. This is a station that represents freedom in this country. And if you don't defend the freedom right now, we are in the process of losing it. This is a serious fight. And, no, and no. Oracle is making a huge difference. Hold on, Doug, can that and run that constantly on the network as a pro? <laughs> you, you are such a great, courageous whistleblower, um, and to have you say that and, and to kind of makes us all feel good, like this is, we're actually accomplishing something here, though I wasn't with Oracle when all of that happened. Uh, I saw what they did, and I think that was fantastic. So good, good for all the people here and Doug Owen and all these guys that do that because these are the people that can benefit from it. Let's start, a, I think we should kind of keep this in chronological order if we can, but um, tell people about yourself, and then let's kind of start before 9-11 as you are uh, on the ground in Iraq trying to end these uh, vicious and selectively enforced U.N. Uh, resolution sanctions against the people of Iraq. Uh, but give us a little yeah. hint into who you are and how this all started for you. Well, first of all, um, I was actually in the United States doing uh, work at the United Nations, but I had also taken a trip to Iraq. So my work is actually done at the United Nations here in, in New York. Um, I was what's called a U.S. intelligence asset. I had been recruited by the CIA and the Defense Intelligence Agency back in the early 1990s, 1993, okay? Um, and I had, had worked, uh, I had covered Libya from early 1995, and I picked up Iraq in 1996. And I covered, I, that meant that I was having um, meetings with Iraqi diplomats about every three weeks, uh, continuously for seven years. I was one of the, the, the CIA, uh, George Tenet, uh, the former CIA director, has said that he could count on one hand the number of CIA agents inside Iraq. And so my position at the United Nations was extremely important as a back channel for, for which we used for anti-terrorism intelligence. So my focus was always anti-terrorism first and foremost. And, and so I know everything. I know where all the bodies are buried. I know all the lies. I know all the, the intricacies of these, of these issues because I was there. And so, like, the, the problem is that most of you, not you, but I don't mean you, but most of the people have only been hearing from analysts who are secondhand sources. And the secondhand sources don't have any direct contact with the events. But I do. So that's why you should be paying attention to something like this. And that's why they silenced me and they let a lot of people go off. Take us back. Well, first of all, a, a gentleman whose name is going to be coming up uh, quite a bit on the show is uh, your CIA handler. That was Richard Fuse. Um, so you're getting a lot yeah. of this information from him and uh, through some of the sources that you had developed as an anti-counterterrorism uh, uh, asset for the CIA uh, at the United Nations. What when did all of this start? Because I, I think it was for you, um, wasn't it around April of 2001 when you were called into uh, Richard Fuse's office, asked specifically to uh, start checking into any intelligence regarding uh, 
people using airplanes uh, to use as bombs and uh, hijack those to, to attack New York. Uh, can you start there and take us up to 9-11? Yes. I will. Um, for everybody, um, the, the big, the, probably one of the biggest bombshells of my book is that we absolutely expected 9/11 to happen. Uh, I want to. I want to. I want all these radio interviews to be really clear on this point. We want to eradicate this sense of ignorance and confusion. There is no excuse for any politician in Washington to pretend. That they didn't know, that we didn't know. We absolutely did know. And if some politician looks you in the eye and sincerely tells you, oh no, no, that's not true. They're either a liar or a fool. But you should not listen to them at all. <laughs> because they don't know what they're talking did you just about. Call Condoleezza Rice a liar and a fool? I think you're letting her off easy, quite frankly, but. <laughs> So War crimes. So she was out of the loop, and she misspoke when she said we had no idea anything like this would happen. Tell us why that is uh, an untruth. That, that's, that's beyond untruth. That's an obscenity. Uh, that is an obscenity. Uh, my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse, uh, and, and my, my former... In- uh, defense intelligence handler Paul Hoven would never. Now, now here, here's where you have to understand: there are factions in the intelligence community. One of the biggest mistakes of an audience of a, of a general public audience is they think the intelligence community is monolithic and that everyone is functioning in lockstep. That's not true. It's a mistake. It's a common misconception. Uh, we, we're broken into teams. And our team uh, had a focus of anti-terrorism, and we had worked on anti-terrorism together from 1993 until 2002. And to put that in context, I had 700 to 800 meetings with Paul and Richard Fuse in those nine years. And we saw each other on a weekly basis. In the year 2001, Richard Fuse and I spoke on the phone on a daily basis. Okay, I would say that from April and May of 2001 onwards, we talked, he and I spoke about 9-11 practically every single week. Okay, Richard was very highly agitated that this attack was, that there was going to be, a, beginning in April of 2001, uh, he, he summoned me to his office, and he said he had a message that he wanted me to deliver to the Iraqis at the United Nations. And he said that he wanted me to, he wanted me to put out a, a, a stern inquiry to Iraqi and Libyan diplomats that if they had heard any news about airplane hijackings, They were to report it through my back channel immediately. And if they did not report it through my back channel, and if we found out that they knew, then we would bomb them back into the Stone Age. And they would be, and and he said, and, and he was especially fierce about Iraq. He said, we will bomb Iraq harder than they have ever been bombed before. This will be a war situation, and we will be very aggressive in punishing them for not giving us this information. So, this is April of 2001. Did he say so April 2000, he got this sorry. intelligence that he asked you to go follow up on and he wanted to hold the Iraqis under this uh, so-called microscope here? Where, where did, I mean, did you, because you must have said, oh, this is a pretty big thing, you know, how do we know this? Did, do you get to ask those questions or you say, yes, sir, I'm right on it? Well, well, the first, the first thing I did, um, when, when he first said this to me, you know, he summoned me to his office. And I was like, okay, sure, Richard, you know, I, I have contacts with the Iraqis all the time. I'll go give him the message. So the first thing I did was I went to New York and I, and I gave the Iraqis a very polite message. I said, hey, you know, if you hear anything about airplane hijackings, we're kind of watching to see if there's any kind of conspiracy. This was right after the Lockerbie trial. So my first inclination was to believe that Richard was concerned that terrorists would have a copycat uh, attack, uh, which is very normal. Sure. It's very normal for terrorists to, to imitate previous attacks that have been successful, and the Lockerbie trial was going throughout the, the year of 2000. So, uh, I, I went to, so I went up to the Iraqi embassy and I delivered a very polite message. Then I went back to Richard Hughes, and he said, so, he demanded to see me. He said, so, what did the Iraqis say? I said, oh, well, I was very polite. He said, I didn't tell you to be polite. 
And he screamed at me and yelled at me like he has never yelled at me ever again. Um, storming around his office saying, God damn it, bleep, 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 I told you to say da 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 you know, if I were to say that, everything he said, the FCC would shut you down. <laughs> Screaming obscenities about how he wanted to bomb, he wanted me to go back to New York and tell my diplomatic contacts this would be a declaration of war. We would attack Iraq in, in a wartime scenario. We would, we, would, we would punish Iraq viciously. If they didn't give us this information, we would, we would, we would hurt, we, we, would, we would bomb them worse than anything that they'd ever been bombed before. And the problem was is that we bombed Iraq so many times, and the sanctions were already so bad that, that it was even difficult for Richard to explain how it could possibly be worse than what it already was. You see, the Iraq, it's hard to tell the Iraqis you're going to hurt them even more than they're hurting if they're already hurting so bad. What I'm trying to understand is um, Dr. Fuse, your, your handler in this case, is he trying to, in your own estimation, give me your opinion or if you have facts, uh, give me those, please. Sure. Is he trying to develop a, a case to be used at a later date against the Iraqis, or is he really in the dark and maybe trying to find out intelligence about who might be hijacking planes and crashing them into buildings uh, six months later? Sure. Uh, that's a very good question. In this situation, uh, I believe it's it, – and, and this is a very, very good question. Uh, Richard was in the dark. Now, here's the thing. From May of 2001, I, I delivered a very harsh message to the Iraqis. Every single, about approximately every week that Richard and I meet after May, by June, we are, by June definitely, we're talking about this attack every week. Every time I go see him, or practically every time we go, I go see him, we're discussing it over and over and over again. Richard was very agitated about it. By June, we had identified that this would be a, he told me, Richard told me, this would be a terrorist attack involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center. This was not a, an, uh, an ambiguous right. target. This was say. very no, definite. It could have been anywhere. We, okay, we, we were lying. We did have some intelligence. They were going to use planes as bombs, but we didn't know where they were going to strike, which is completely blown out of the water by your testimony, Susan. Yeah, absolutely. We knew by June, but by April and May, we were looking for airplane hijackings. By June, we expected airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center specifically. We now, know, my CIA... Do we know would be on September 11th? Do we know it would be in September? Um, that, that doesn't give them an excuse not to begin to look... Well, no, no, hold on, hold on, sorry. But by, by in June, uh, Richard was frantic. He kept saying to me... As if I was a child, he'd say, look, Susan, uh, when you go talk to your Iraqi diplomatic contacts, I want you to tell them that we're looking for any fragment of intelligence. Because he was, like, really agitated about it. He was not calm and patient about this. He was like, we want any fragment of intelligence. I want you to, you are anti-war. You don't, you don't want them, us to go to war with Iraq, so you better tell Iraq that uh, at the highest levels of the government he said this is way he, he says to me Susan this is way above me at the very highest levels of the government it has been decided and this is by May of 2001 and June of 2001 it has been decided that if there is this attack involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center then the US will declare war there will be a major military operation against Iraq. It will be worse than anything they've ever seen. They cannot fathom what we're going to do, but we have already decided that that's going to be the response. Now, this is before 9-11. This is, this is like months before 9-11. By August, I can tell you the date. It was August 2nd, the date of FBI Director Robert Mueller's uh, nomination hearings in the Senate. Um, 
uh, Richard Fuse and I were talking on the telephone, and, comp- and I was complaining to Richard about how I thought Robert Mueller was throwing terrorism investigations, and that he was playing games with terrorism to make politicians in Washington look good. And I and Richard said, "Yeah, I know that you, you know, that I know about Lockerbie. Well, who's the, what's the other case?" And I said, "Well, I think the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, because he says that you know Timothy McVeigh and, and Terry Nichols acted alone without any help." No. And that's just ridiculous. I mean, there's a whole bunch of evidence to show that that's not true. Well, and I said, I said, because I know sorry. a little bit about this as well. When George Bush had created something after the first Iraq War called Operation Iraqi Paperclip, uh, clip, where he kind of like the Nazi paperclips, is and where he uh, brought in some of the uh, controlled assets to work on things like this. And this also gave them a second excuse, another way to uh, keep Iraq and Saddam Hussein on the ropes because they can always bring out that footage that we never got to see of John Doe number 2, who was, uh, to many people's uh, information, Al Hussein Husseini, who was also, according to our information, working at Logan Airport on the day of 9-11. Yeah, yeah, there you go, there you go. Yes, very good. But there's even more to it than that because, well, after 9/11, we'll, we'll come back to after 9/11 later on. Um, because there's there's a, there's some groundbreaking stuff that happens after 9/11 that relates to this what you just said. Um, but before 9/11, uh, on August 2nd, Richard says to me, you know, oh, Sus- you know, I, I okay, he and I are talking. I'm telling him that that that. Uh, uh, Robert Mueller is the Arlen Specter of anti-terrorism, and you know the single bullet theory that killed Kennedy. And I said, this is just you know, he, he just simplifies things to the point where you can't even it doesn't even make sense anymore. And and uh, and, and and I tell Richard that I'm going back up to New York to t- talk to my F, my uh, my Iraqi hand my Iraqi contacts. And Richard says to me. Oh my God, that's terrible! No, no, no! Do not go to New York! Oh God, do not do that! And I'm like, well, wait, 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 Richard, Richard! You know, I, I've been talking to the Iraqis all summer long. I need to get feedback from the Iraqis to see if they've heard anything from Baghdad. I need to know, you know, if they've if they've, if they've got answers on the on the intelligence requests we've made. And he said, Oh no, Susan, it's too dangerous. Don't go to New York. He, and I said, Richard, do you think the attack is imminent? He said, yes. He said, absolutely. He said, he said we're expecting mass casualties. And we, you know, we're, we're looking at this as, as a, as a, as a serious, you know, this, this is, this is not going to be a localized, localized attack. This could have major repercussions throughout the city. And, and I don't want you going into New York at all until after the attack is over. Well, it'd be nice if and I said, all the people of New York there, uh, who died, but uh, I guess they, they couldn't get to all that. I'm sorry? Well, it would have been nice if they would have warned the people in Oklahoma City, the children there, and the people that died in New York at the World Trade Center towers, or the people in the Pentagon, uh, that this was all coming. Uh, because they warned you. Uh, I heard other people were warned as well. We heard Larry Silverstein was warned, uh, Giuliani, some other people. Uh, but they didn't warn. They warned the mayor of San Francisco, Willie Brown, okay? They just didn't warn oh. the, the children and the people in there. Uh, because this was, you know, you just have to think this was the plan all along. Um, you know, and I think the excuse that this is eventually going to come out, and the excuse is going to be, well, we wanted to catch these guys. We were running a sting operation, so uh, it just got out of hand. This is the way 1993 World Trade Center bombing went down, as I'm sure you know. Yes, 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 uh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. Um, but, 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 you, but you see... So, so on August 2nd, I tell him that I will go up to New York, and I can tell you the date. I said, I'll go up to New York the, the Saturday, the day after tomorrow, which is August 4th, and I will come to your office on August 6th. Now, what I, have, what I understand is that on August 6th, uh, and I did, uh, I went to Richard's office and he said, so, did they know anything? Do they have anything? And, of course, Iraq kept telling us over and over and over again that they had no intelligence regarding this conspiracy. They didn't know anything about it. They had been listening for it, and if they had heard anything, they would pass it back to us. But at that point, Iraq was trying to get the weapons inspectors back into Baghdad 
and they had been developing a comprehensive peace framework for ending the sanctions. This is and very so, important uh, because, again, it shows like in Afghanistan, they offered to give up bin Laden, they, it was refused. Uh, we've got a, uh, this yeah. is really important. I want to stress this, but I do have to go to break uh, here in just a few Okay, seconds. sorry. So let's pick up there when we come back. We'll move through 9 11. We'll talk more about Iraq and uh, how they really did want to try to work with us. And then uh, we'll. Are well, thanks for joining us. Deadline Live, Jack Blood Oracle Broadcasting and Affiliates. I want to forget all the great affiliates like Revere Radio out there that are picking us up. Uh, all you people out there that are streaming us in your places of work so everyone can hear what our guest today, Susan Lindauer, is saying. Uh, she is the author of the new book, uh, Extreme Prejudice. It is out everywhere. It tells this story in a way that we probably can't tell it in an hour with commercials. That's that's the challenge that we face. So we'll, we'll be scratching the surface somewhat here. you got to get the book to fill in some of the blanks. Susan, thanks again for joining us. And, and one question I meant to ask you straight off um, to kind of qualify all of this. You were a CIA asset, and generally, uh, as a, an employee of the CIA, <laughs> you got to get clearance to write a book like this. Ah, here's the funny thing. As an asset, I was not, very good question, I was not a paid employee at the CIA. I was a private citizen who was, who was fulfilling a, uh, uh, a special role in contact with uh, CIA targets. And it's a very interesting <laughs> role to play. Um, but I was not an employee of the CIA, and my intelligence handler, Richard Fuse, who was, and who received $13 million in non-taxable income, non-taxable income after 9-11. He received the money, and he he got a ton of money, Uh, but I did not. Well, you received confinement and and, uh, and, uh, tax. That's what you received. I was, yes, yes. But Richard got it, yeah. I wanted to ask that question because, you know, people are always very suspicious when somebody uh, blows the whistle. And I I like to accept things uh, at face value, but also be a little bit skeptical. So people are going to ask that question. So this book, completely without any clearance, without any uh, oversight from the (laughs) society. Well, it's really funny because when they arrested me, um, it became quickly clear that they had not talked to my CIA handler, Richard Fuse, because he would have told them, he would have warned them that because I was working in anti-terrorism, he and I had agreed uh, that I would have never sign a single non-disclosure agreement because the people that I was dealing with might put me in danger of, of you know, of my access to these people could be viewed in a conspiratorial sense if it was played the wrong way. So it would be imperative for me to have the right to say what I was doing and to bring clarity to the fact that I was trying to stop terrorism not participating in it. And especially because I was dealing with Libya, Iraq, Egypt, Yemen, Syria, Hezbollah, and Malaysia. Okay? I was dealing with some heavy duty uh, sponsors of, ter- of, 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 of terrorism from the standpoint of the United States government. And I was against terrorism, but always, always, no question. But my CIA handler was like, you have got to be able to protect yourself because, you know, God forbid you get into a situation where they decide to punish you and you are in, and you're screwed. You'll, you'll be screwed. So what ended up happening is that when I did get arrested, uh, I had a, a kind of a loaded gun pointed at the Justice Department, and they had a gun that didn't have any real ammunition in it because I really hadn't done anything wrong. I was accused of eating a couple of cheeseburgers. Yeah, we'll get with the Iraqi cheeseburgers in the Patriot Act. Let, let's try to keep things yeah. up here for the audience. Okay, and sorry, along. sorry. Okay, so we left off. We're in about August of uh, 2001. August of 2001, I was told that, the, that, the, the, that an attack involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center was imminent and that it was too dangerous for me to go back to New York and that I should... And, and that I should stay out of New York until after the attack. 
where the CIA was confounded was that I then turned around and I had friends who were living in New York or who had or my brother was living in Hoboken, New Jersey, and I told my brother to stay out of New York. I had friends who had family in the suburbs of New York and I told him and his family members to stay out of New York. So I had witnesses who were who were civilians that I was telling other people about this attack. So what the, the FBI and the Justice Department never expected was that I could prove this through non-CIA sources. Ah, now that's how we get them. But September 11th, there's one more thing that I need to tell you. On the date of September 11th, um, the, the, the first building had just fallen, and the second building was still standing. And Richard Fuse and I were on the telephone, and we were, at this point, we were shouting at each other. I mean, shouting at the TV. I mean, we were, everybody was, the whole country was, was horrified and, and, and outraged and, and devastated. And Richard Fuse and I had a special feeling for this attack because we had expected it. We had planned, we had, we had planned, we'd, 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 we'd we, we tried to stop it. <laughs> we had we had we, we had we had busted our overtime trying to figure out what to do about it. And uh, in August of 2001, Richard had instructed me to contact the office of the Attorney General John Ashcroft. His I had I had contact numbers for his private staff in his personal office. That's about 20 people, and I had contacted those people and told them that we were we expected a major attack was imminent and we asked for an emergency broadcast alert across all agencies of the Justice Department. The Attorney General Jack, John Ashcroft's private staff gave me a phone number to call at the Office of Counterterrorism and they said, please repeat exactly what you just told us to them. And again, I repeated, we wanted an emergency broadcast alert through all agencies of the Justice Department for any fragment of intelligence on airplane hijackings. And I said, we believe there will be a strike on the World Trade Center. And then on the day of the attack... Richard Fuse and I are shouting at the TV, and Richard blurts out to me, Susan, how often do you think that people are, that, 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 uh, that somebody's standing on a sidewalk with a video camera queued up to take a picture of an, of a, of a car crash? How often do you think that somebody's just standing there waiting with the camera all ready to go, and then lo and behold, there is a car crash right in front of them? And he said, and, and, and this was a day before the video footage was released of the airplanes flying into the World Trade Center. Yeah. Well, Let me be very specific. Because Sorry. people now are going to hear that and go, oh, well, everyone has a camera and everyone's running. They got a camera. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. One, they didn't. No, no. To 2001, they didn't. And they were, and they, and they, this camera was not whipped around. This was a steady shot. And they, and, and what Richard Fuse said is, how often does this happen where, there, where a camera's queued up for, for a car accident? He said it never happens. And the camera's not whipped around. It's very, it's held constant. He, say, he said to me, Susan, those are Mossad agents who took those that video footage. And we know. And, I, and I, at the and time, we well, hold on, at the time, the vid sorry. Well, we know that Israel had prior knowledge, so they've got a couple of their agents there filming this whole thing and just waiting for it to happen. We've heard about the mm -hmm. dancing Israelis uh, who seem to be very happy that all this was going on. Please, please continue. No, no, this is, it, it is very important because uh, my reaction to that was, you mean to tell me that I've been looking for, I, I yelled at him, I was just like, I got really upset. And I said, you mean to tell me I've been looking for this damn f fragments of intelligence on this attack and the Israelis knew about it the whole time and they didn't tell us? And I said, God, I was just screaming at the phone at that point. I was just hysterical. I mean, the whole, the, the World Trade Center had just collapsed. Okay, the first building had just collapsed, and I'm watching in horror as this building drops to the ground, and, and I'm like, you mean the Israelis knew, and I've been busting my ass trying to figure it out, and they didn't tell us, and Richard, and the phone immediately clicked dead, and I called Richard, because I, I, I was getting hyster I was getting pretty upset, and uh, I called Richard back to try and sound more calm, and he said, Susan, we must never discuss that ever again. 
And I said, but, but I was still very upset. I said, but Richard, but Richard. He said, no, Susan, we must never talk about that again. We still have a lot of ground to cover with Susan Lindauer. Um, her book is Extreme Prejudice. We're here like you, listening to all of this and uh, putting it all into perspective. ExtremeprejudiceUSA.wordpress.com is her website. Uh, check it out. We'll be back for a final segment. Try to get through all of this and tie it all in. There's a lot to still cover. Stay with us. Deadline Live. with us extreme prejudice is her book you can get that anywhere and uh look i mean susan is um, anti-war that's one of the things one of the reasons she wants this information to get out is to try to end this madness and show people uh, uh and teach them a little bit about false flag terrorism so she is a, a one of our great whistleblowers um you can agree with her or not that that has really nothing to do with any of this susan uh, what i want to do here is I want to like finish up uh, with 9/11. I want to go to how you were uh, busted under the Patriot Act and detained, and why, and who did that. Uh, a little bit about Colin Powell in Iraq, and then we've got to get you out of here. So we got about 10 minutes to try to get through all of that. I'm just going to let you. Uh, here's the fishing line. Go. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. A lot of people say, well, you know, we don't believe in the hijackings. We believe in the detonation theory. Well, I want you to know that I believe that both of them happened. Uh, I'm absolutely the hijackings occurred. There were airplane hij airplane parts found on the ground. Yes, yes, that did happen. But what you what what has been missing is the understanding that we did have advanced knowledge of the attack, and they had already made a decision of what would happen to Iraq. Before 9-11 ever happened, they had already decided to go to war. And therefore, that was the incentive for com deliberate command negligence. We know that NORAD was not activated for forewarned of, of the potential threat to U.S. Under sovereign drills. territory. Yeah. Because of the drills, we know that they failed to put, you know, uh, anti-machine gun, anti-aircraft batteries on top of the World Trade Center. There are things that were very simple to do that were not done. And it was deliberate command negligence. That is the very important thing. And the, the motivation, you know, people say to me, well, you cannot have, it's, it's just um, two million to one. It's impossible to have an airplane attack and a detonation coincided to the same day. No, it's not. Because if they know in advance that it's going to happen, uh, and then they know approximately the date that it's going to happen, and then they know the outcome of the of the attack. What they knew was what, what, this would be an orphan team that did it and that went in and they knew that there was going to be an Arab attack, so they wanted to make sure that it had maximum devastating consequences so that they could secure their real goal, which was the war in Iraq. It sounds okay. like, in a way, you're, you're giving us a, a let it happen on purpose with uh, extra emphasis rather than they made it all happen on purpose. Did, did you have a Well, they did make it all happen on purpose. They, they both. The, the Arabs were, they already knew the Arabs were going to do it, but they probably also had studied the Arabs and they knew that they were kind of clowns. They weren't really good terrorists. They weren't really good Muslims. What if they didn't do very much damage? Most terrorist attacks, if you look at the first World Trade Center attack in 93 and um, the USS Cole bombing in t October 2000, those had minimal damage. There were five people who died in the first World Trade Center attack. Once the smoke clears and you have the sensation of, oh, my God, there was an attack on the World Trade Center, yeah. very little actually happens. Same with the USS Cole. Twelve people died. Yes, it was a big deal. It was like a huge big deal. However, twelve people died. The USS Cole survived, okay? It wasn't blown to smithereens. There wasn't like a nuclear bomb know, that went off. And of worms, too. Um, so 9-11, it actually, then it happens. What? So, so then somebody, somebody had to make sure that 9-11 was going to go off with maximum force. That's why a team would have gone in. And I want to close with one last statement. Sorry. I know from writing my book, uh, while I was writing my book, I had a senior State Department official tell me that he, know, he had personally studied the janitorial services at the World Trade Center and activities in 
uh, late August of 2001, and at 3 o'clock, uh, after the janitorial services had left at approximately 2 to 2.30 in the morning, strange vans were arriving at the World Trade Center, and they were arriving at about 3 o'clock in the morning, and they were leaving at about 4.35, 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, for about 10 days or two weeks. And he told me that he had personally studied the um, the number of employees in the janitorial services. He knew where they lived. He knew the revenues for the company. He knew who owned the company. He had studied this at length, and he was convinced that those separate. He, he was convinced those were different vans that were not tied to janitorial services, and that they had entered the World Trade Center for the purpose of rigging deton- uh, explosives. In, in the uh, elevator shafts, and once the ele- once it's rigged, it doesn't matter if the bu- if, if the planes are attacked, if the building is attacked by the airplanes on the ninth or the tenth or the eleventh or the twelfth or the thirteenth, because once it's done, once it's in there, at whatever point the World Trade Center gets hit, you can have a controlled demolition, which brings the whole thing down, and then you have secured your ultimate goal of going to war with Iraq, and that is the key. You have to, the, the two things that have been missing from the 9-11 truth community are one, the absolute fact that we absolutely knew about this attack. There is no question, if anybody, if any politician ever tells you that we didn't know, he's a liar or a fool. Secondly, they had already made the decision to go to war with Iraq before this ever happened. And so that was the motivation. Well, as I told Remember, you, there, we, we have you a- never have a crime. Sorry, sorry. Have you project- never have a crime without a motive. The Project for New American Century, which kind of starts spelling this out. We have uh, 10 years of history at least preceding this. And then we have Donald Rumsfeld and FOIA request talking to his aide, Stephen Camboni, that um, sweep it all up. Go massive. Okay, blame this on Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein no matter what. This is just minutes after the uh, so-called attack on the Pentagon. So, I mean, this is all out in the open. We know that through FOIA requests. We're, we have about three minutes here, so spend um, spend a little time on... You went to the. You, you have all this information. The, the, reason, the reason you don't know about me until now... Sorry. The reason you don't know about me until now is that I was arrested back in 2004, and I was held under indictment for five years and gagged and locked up in prison on a Texas military base, and and my reputation was destroyed. In five years, I never had a trial. I was never allowed to have. In five years of 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 indictment, I, I was allowed one morning of testimony by two. Uh, witnesses. One was a, congr- a former congressional chief of staff, and the other was a, a university professor who testified that I had been a U.S. intelligence asset, and secondly, that I had warned about 9-11. And in one morning of testimony with two witnesses, I slammed it out of the ballpark. <laughs> and we, we, were, we were swinging for the fences, and we got it. But, but if it was not for that testimony and their truth-telling, this would this story would have been lost forever because the government fought so hard they did they pulled every dirty trick in the book to stop you from ever knowing the truth so please do read this book because this is very important stuff there's a lot more that we haven't even talked about like Iraq's con- efforts to contribute to the 9/11 investigation which you don't even know about We've never even talked about this stuff because it's just it's just it just goes so much bigger than what you're expecting. Well, and the fact is, like Afghanistan, Iraq was trying to, they didn't want to be bombed back into the Stone Age. They didn't have any weapons of mass destruction. Largely, that was a bluff, as we found out. They were working in every capacity to make deals, to cooperate fully with every contention of the Bush administration and the Clinton administration before it. Hugh Shelton just came out. General Hugh Shelton, he wrote a book and said they were sitting around the table uh, in the Clinton administration uh, thinking about how they could shoot down a spy plane and blame it on Saddam Hussein. I mean, they've just been trying to do this over and over again back in the Gulf Wars. And as you probably know, we know now through April Gillespie that they gave permission for uh, Saddam Hussein to attack Kuwait and then went in and cleaned up the mess. Uh, they were set up royally for this. But the, the alternative information that you have in your book that you can talk about extensively working in this chain of command, in this compartmentalized chain of command here, is that Iraq did everything they could to avoid that war. Not that we didn't, we heard that on the mainstream media and that this all... Never, never. The money, the death, 
the, uh, the, uh, the, the fact that we're turning people into terrorists to hate us now because we've been torturing their children for information. Um, all of this could have been avoided had we just done business uh, as usual. But for whatever reason, I think a lot of this has to do with Babylon, and uh, this is their little homeland over there. Um, the, the fact that they had these oil contracts, the fact that, that China uh, was moving into their territory, something had to be done. And eventually, when this all comes out, they'll tell us that they did this for our benefit so we don't have $20 a gallon oil and China doesn't take over the world. I've heard that, and I just can't wait for them to finally start admitting this, Susan Lindauer. Uh, Heirloom Organics, non high